And, and I'm starting Great. the webinar. And now I'm going to go after the peat seeker. You don't have to sing on this song if you don't want to. If you like the idea, though, you can help me out. If you love your Uncle Sam, bring him home. Bring him home. Support our boys in Vietnam. Bring him home. Bring him home. It'll make our general sad, I know. Bring him home. Bring him home. They want to tangle. Bring them home, bring them home. They don't have the right weaponry. Bring them home, bring them home. The world's got hunger and ignorance. Bring them home, bring them home. You can't beat that with bombs and guns. Bring them home, bring them home. So if you love your uncles. Sing this song, bring a song, bring a song. Now there's one thing I will confess, bring a song, bring a song. I'm not really a pacifist, bring a song, bring a song. If an army invaded this land of mine, bring a song, you find me out on the firing line, bring a song. Bring a home, even if they drop their queens to bombs. Bring a home, bring a home. Though they brought helicopters and a bomb. Bring a home, bring a home. So if you love your Uncle Sam, support our boys in Vietnam. Bring a home, bring a home. Yes, show these generals their power. They don't have the right weaponry. Bring them home, bring them home. The world needs housing, food, and schools. Bring them home, home, home. And learning a few universal rules. Bring them home, bring them home. So if you love your uncle. Welcome. Welcome to our panelists and also to the folks around the country that have joined the uh, webinar. Um, we are, well, <laughs> and naturally at this moment, my dog decides to bark. Um, and we we have one. All right. Um, we have a slight technical problem that uh, uh, the uh, link to for the panelists has gone out more broadly. So people may show up that way and I'll have to, to take their video out and, and I'll actually be removing them. Um, and now I can't do that because then he can't get back in. So um, any rate, we will continue with that, and we may see John Kent's name showing up at the bottom of the screen. Uh, but most of the time, only the person speaking will be seen. Uh, so if the speakers can, can at this point mute their, their uh, videos so that we don't have uh, problems like my dog barking. 
um, uh, we will start the program. I'm John McAuliffe. I, one of my roles in life is to serve as the coordinator of the Vietnam Peace Commemoration Committee. This is one of some 18 or 20 webinars we've done about different aspects of the history of the anti-war movement. Uh, our goal is, is to have the actors in the history talking about it and putting that in a permanent form on YouTube, on our YouTube channel, so that some diligent graduate student 20 years from now will be able to actually see the people that he or she are writing about and add depth to uh, this the thesis that they write about the anti-war movement. Any rate, that's our broader goal. The goal of this particular program is to try to re to correct uh, the history uh, to make sure that that uh, people understand the close relationship between the civilian anti-war movement and resistors within the military and the folks who uh, became very active while they were still wearing the uniform uh, and were taking the biggest risks. I am going to ask our first speaker, J.J. Johnson, to start, uh, and I will mute so the talk is not heard. J.J. is a member, was a member of the Fort Hood Three, who refused orders for Vietnam in 1966, which was one of the earliest acts of collective GI resistance to the war. Each each speaker will go on for about eight minutes, and we will have Q and A at the end. J.J. Uh, thank you, John. <clears throat> and John, thank you for your service. And I, that goes for all the all the panelists. You know, I, I have to say, I'm always humbled when I'm asked to participate in a discussion with frontline activists, which I am not. But I hope that my remarks can contribute in some way to the vital work that you do. The roots of my understanding and activity, of course, begins with my family. <clears throat> My parents married in their teens in their homeland, the US Virgin Islands. They believed passionately in caring and sharing. By 1947, my young mother had given birth to my two older sisters, me and my younger brother. We settled in East Harlem in a neighborhood notorious for its gang and drug trade. We were poor, but my family never turned away a relative, friend or acquaintance who needed to, a place to lay their head or a meal to fill their empty stomach. Our home was open to all our playmates, playmates regardless of their ethnicity. My dad was a shop steward in District 65, which was a catch-all union that organized low-paid workers. I recall as a small child going to Labor Day marches, listening to the voice of Paul Robeson on our photograph, and seeing the name Vito Mark Antonio on campaign literature for our popular left-wing congressman. Although there was not much discussion of my dad's work or his role in his union, there is no question that his examples of unity and solid solidarity penetrated my consciousness. His radical union environment though was somewhat at odds with what I was being taught in my Catholic school. I entered school during the Red Scare when we were taught to hide under our desks in the event of a so Soviet nuclear attack. At the same time, the Catholic Church, of which my family were members, was also leading the crusade to add the words under God to the Pledge of Allegiance. That reactionary indoctrination continued through high school. There I was taught that Dr. Martin Luther King was misleading the Negro race. And I have to say, although my parents sent us to Catholic school for its discipline, and I, I think as a hedge against the temptation of the Harlem streets, they didn't really buy all that the church was selling. My dad, for instance, was an active militant trade unionist. He recruited co-workers for the 1963 March on Washington, where the misleader of my people delivered his iconic speech. My dad offered to take me with him to Washington, but not understanding its significance, I declined. But I believe his enthusiasm and his explanation of why it was important must have planted a seed. Another seed was planted, unfortunately, a year later, 
While as a college freshman, I landed a part-time job at United Parcel Service. After about five months loading trucks, I said farewell to a coworker who told me he was leaving to work on a leaving to go to work on a voter registration drive in Mississippi. We hadn't really talked much during work, so I was somewhat perplexed. Why is this young man going to Mississippi? Weeks later, I saw his photo in the local newspaper under the headline, Three Civil Rights Workers Killed in Mississippi. The photo of my coworker, Andrew Goodman, was alongside those of James Cheney and Michael Schwerner. I had no idea when he left that he was in such danger. And I scolded myself for a long time for not thanking him or at least wishing him luck. I dropped out of, of, of college during my sophomore year and I was drafted into the army on December 6, 1965. When I stepped forward to take the oath of enlistment, I noticed that one of the draftees refused to step forward with the rest of us. And that was Dennis Moore turned out to be one of the Fort Hood Three. I spoke to Dennis briefly on the train that took us to Fort Jackson, South Carolina for our orientation. That short discussion helped to start the wheels turning. I saw Dennis again just once during basic training at Fort Hood, Texas. Again, we spoke briefly, but we ended up in the same advanced training signal corps at Fort Gordon, Georgia. Dennis, who had a left wing background and another soldier at Fort Gordon started a study group on the Vietnam and the war. I was one of about seven GIs in that group. In the group, I took all the readings and I devoured everything I could get my hands on. My eyes began to open up and I was, for instance, I was surprised to learn in 1924, Ho Chi Minh, having worked in the US, published a pamphlet entitled The Black Race. The pamphlet denounced lynching of African-Americans in the US. That helped to bring into focus the links connecting struggles for self-determination. But reading for us was not enough. On our free time, we met with local peace activists who gave us staunch encouragement and members of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, SNCC, which was the first national civil rights group to oppose the US aggression in Southeast Asia. Those meetings and activists we spoke with, we spoke with strengthened our resolve. We learned at that point that we were not alone. Dennis, Dave, and I returned to our single core unit in Fort Hood, Texas. My attempts to apply for conscientious objector status failed miserably. Within weeks, we received our orders to go to Vietnam. During our 30-day leave prior to our scheduled departure date, we met with a host of anti-war activists and progressives. We decided that the greatest contribution we could make was to publicly announce that our conscience would not permit us to take part in an illegal, immoral, and unjust war. We were joined at a June 30 press conference in which we announced our intention to refuse by well-known pacifists such as A.J. Musty and Dave Dellinger, and by civil rights leaders, including Stokely Carmichael of SNCC and Lincoln Lynch of CORE, which was the Congress of Racial Equality. But not surprisingly, we were arrested before our 30-day leave was up. We were tried and convicted in September. But with time off for good behavior, we eventually served 28 months of our three-year sentences. The support of the anti-war and progressive communities our families and our commitment to each other saw us through, not to mention the strength of the Vietnamese and their courageous struggle. By the time we were released in our late October, 1968, the movement both outside and inside the military had grown dramatically. When we entered Leavenworth in the fall of 1966, it housed 500 prisoners. Two years later, the number had swelled to 1,500 a clear reflection of opposition within the ranks to the war. That opposition is, is chronicled in um, Dave's book, um, Soldiers in Revolt. Where have these experiences led me? I believe that today, the two great ex existential crises are the climate catastrophe and the march toward nuclear annihilation. I think I became a labor journalist because I also firmly believe that structural change in this country is not possible without the broad mobilization of working people. I also believe that economic progress is inextricably linked to racial equality. I believe the nation remains, as Dr. King stated decades ago, the greatest purveyor of violence in the world. 
I believe that the war on terror is a war on our human needs. According to the Watson Institute, you probably know this, Pentagon spending has topped 14 trillion, not billion, trillion dollars since the start of the war in Afghanistan. Of course, all to the light of Lockheed Martin, Boeing, Raytheon, Journal Dynamics, Northrop Grumman, and others that profit handsomely from death and destruction. I believe the US and NATO, which to me are synonymous, are willing to fight to the last Ukrainian death rather than work to negotiate and into the war. And finally, I believe that as we meet, Israel is guilty of genocide and other war crimes in Gaza. Thank you. Yeah, the dog is still barking. <laughs> Thanks. JJ, which of the Virgin Islands are, is your family from? St. Croix. It's, it's a beautiful part of the country and it should have the right to vote. So it's, and Puerto Rico also. <laughs> for sure. For sure. Um, the next speaker will be Susan Schnall. She was a Navy nurse who was court-martialed for helping to organize an anti-war march of soldiers and civilians in San Francisco in 1968. Currently, she's president of Veterans for Peace. Susan. Thank you, John. And thank you to the Vietnam Peace Commemoration Committee for this invitation to speak with you about the GI and veteran anti-war movement and our civilian comrades. Thank you so much. JJ, it's just incredible for me to listen to you today. I know we've had many political conversations over a number of years, but I need to start my discussion by saying JJ certainly was one of my heroes when I joined the United States Navy. It is an honor for me to be part of an extraordinary and special group of people, those GIs and veterans who returned from war and armed conflict to work for peace and social justice in this country. For them, it's been a wrenching, painful journey from war maker to peacemaker, to be able to question both themselves and their country that participated in unjust, immoral conflict, to be able to look at their adolescent selves and question their very identity, to take a moral journey back to a time when they were in a country thousands of miles away from United States borders, members of a military that was killing and destroying the people and land in Southeast Asia. And I would just echo what JJ mentioned, which is, and we continue today in Ukraine, backing Israel. We have a long way to go to reach our goals of peace and justice. Those once young American Vietnam soldiers have become old men and live with the memory of what they did so many years ago. They don't want to be thanked for their service in Vietnam. They want to be forgiven. In 1967, I graduated from Stanford University wearing a black armband signifying my objection to the war in Vietnam. I had joined the Navy Nurse Corps to care for the wounded from war heal them and get them back home to family and friends. As I mentioned, I had heard about J.J. Johnson and the Fort Hood Three, active duty soldiers who in 1966 refused their orders to Vietnam. It was such an incredible act of courage knowing that they faced imprisonment. The summer following college graduation, when I was in officer's indoctrination school, and that's what the Navy called it, I watched the news about the court-martial of Dr. Howard Levy, who refused to train and educate Green Berets, who would be going to Vietnam to take part in this genocidal war. Their actions, those of JJ and Howard Levy, reminded me that simply healing the soldiers in the war might not be enough that being a part of the military machine enabled the war to continue. And the examples of JJ and Howard provided me with an understanding that I could confront the military and survive. Active duty soldiers protested the war in Vietnam. Some went to prison for several years. Some left their family and friends. 
their known lives to move to Canada or Sweden and gave up everything to protest this unjust illegal war. In 1967, when I was in the United States Navy, I was assigned to the surgical and orthopedic wards. They were World War II barracks crowded with 35 to 40 patients, all young men who had been wounded in Vietnam. They were very young, 17, 18, 19 years old. Some were missing limbs, some were so shot up, they had tubes coming out from various parts of their body, draining excess fluids. I realized again that I couldn't heal my patients, not from the war, from their fear of dying, from their ongoing nightmares. And I realized again that this war had to stop. I was active in an organization called the Medical Committee for Human Rights, a group of healthcare professionals organized in 1964 to provide medical care for civil rights workers, community activists, and volunteers working in Mississippi during the Freedom Summer Project. They provided medical coverage for the civil rights marches led by Dr. Martin Luther King. Members were active in desegregating hospitals in the South, confronting major medical associations for their allowing state associations to remain segregated and providing medical clinics that provided care to those in need in Mississippi. In September, 1968, Michael Locks and Hugh Smith active duty members of the United States Air Force, spoke at one of our MCHR meetings about an upcoming peace demonstration to be held in San Francisco. It would be led by active duty GIs and veterans. This was for me the opportunity to become involved in an anti-war movement organized and led by active duty military with the very active civilian support. I was working with a group organizing this March for Peace to be held in San Francisco on October 12th. They produced the flyers and leaflets that we used to publicize this demonstration. But we had difficulty distributing the flyers on military bases, and certainly at Oak Knoll Naval Hospital. We put up posters about the march in the middle of the night that would be torn down the next day. From the news, I learned that the United States dropped leaflets on the Vietnamese, urging them to go to protective hamlets to avoid the bombings. And I thought, well, if the United States could drop flyers for the war in a country 8,000 miles away, then why couldn't we, for peace, drop our flyers against the war in the United States? I had a friend who was a pilot. We rented a one engine plane and we filled it with flyers announcing the GI and Veterans March for Peace. We dropped them on five military bases in the San Francisco Bay Area. Oak Knoll Naval Hospital, Treasure Island, Europe of Buena Island, the Presidio. And then we flew into Alameda Naval Air Station and dropped them on the deck of an aircraft carrier. We held a press conference afterward where I spoke in my uniform. Two days later, I marched in uniform and spoke against the American war in Vietnam, against this dirty, filthy war and supporting the troops by bringing them home alive. I faced five years at hard labor, but the General Courts Martial Board gave me a sentence of dismissal from service, six months confinement at hard labor, and forfeiture of all pain allowances. My civilian attorney was Richard Wertheimer, a member of the Emergency Committee for Civil Liberties. And I also was represented by Al Benedict, who brought in, he was brought in as an expert in free speech, but the military judge refused to hear him and said those issues would be presented on appeal. In the years since, I moved to New York City, continued my work with MCHR, worked for 31 years in the public hospital system, taught at NYU, retired, and became ever more active with Veterans for Peace, 
with Vietnam veterans against the war. And now, as John mentioned, currently I'm president of the National Veterans for Peace Board of Directors. I thought it would be interesting to tell you a bit about Veterans for Peace and our current membership. As so Please, many- Susan, us, could you hold that for the discussion? please, because we're now sure. moving on to the next person, if you don't mind. No problem. Go ahead, John. Okay. Sorry, it's, I have to be the hardliner. <laughs> Our next speaker is John Kent, who was a Navy fighter pilot who turned in his wings rather than to fly combat missions in Vietnam and helped to organize the concerned officers movement. John. Uh, well, thank you, John, and um, thank you to all the people that have organized this. Uh, this is a really great opportunity. Um, I, just a little bit of background about myself. Um, it, it's true, I was a, a fighter pilot. I graduated from the U.S. Naval Academy at Annapolis, Maryland, and um, I, there I was a two-time All-American wrestler, so I the you know, had this trajectory in mind of becoming the, you know, uh, all American kid, uh, you know, served my time in the military. I wanted to be an astronaut. You know, that was the time when people were going to the moon and, you know, I thought maybe the moon or Mars, who knows, you know, so I had all this, these beautiful thoughts in my mind, but then reality got in the way when the Vietnam War uh, heated up and um, I started to figure out what was happening. I had my first experiences when I was still uh, at Annapolis in 1967. I went to Vietnam in the summer. And uh, I didn't see uh, much combat because I was in um, the Gulf of Tonkin on a Navy ship. But we, we got shelled some and uh, the helicopters that were going in to do search and rescue um, of pilots that had been shot down came back all shut up and people were killed. So there was you know, some some combat, but I uh, didn't really learn much about the war. But what I did start to figure out was something about the, the nature of the uh, United States' empire. And I call that, uh, call it that advisedly, because I've seen a bunch of it around the world. And the, one of the first places I saw was in Subic Bay in the Philippines, where we, uh, our ship pulled in and uh, everybody on board was ecstatic. Oh, this is a wonderful experience. You're gonna love this. This is like a Disneyland for adults. And I'm thinking, what, what does that mean? And uh, so I, you know, naively, uh, you know, get off the ship. We, I get to leave for a couple, for a day or so. Uh, I start walking um, from the Naval base, Subic Bay into the Philippine town uh, called Alamopo. And to do this, we had to cross a bridge, which went from the base onto the local town. And the first thing I notice is that there's uh, there's, uh, there's a river running underneath this uh, bridge. And the first thing I notice is that there's a bunch of uh, GIs on the bridge throwing coins into the water. And uh, so, oh, this is interesting. And I, I take a look over the edge of the bridge, and then I see um, local people, kids mostly, but some adults diving in to get these uh, coins out of the water. And then I look closer at this river and I realized that it was a running sewer. Turds floating down at urine. It was just the most foul smelling, disgusting uh, body of water I think I've ever seen. And here the entertainment for the GIs was to throw coins into the water and get the local population, probably desperate, because you could tell it was an extremely impoverished town, desperate for um, um, money to survive or to live. And they're being fo basically forced to dive into sewage uh, for the entertainment of the US troops. And that, it turned out that this was just the beginning of this so-called Disneyland for adults, that the town was just a degradation after degradation of the local population for the benefit of the GIs. And this is when I was, you know, still in uh, Annapolis and like just to, you know, this just overwhelmed me. I got, I got just sick to my stomach 
I turned around, I went back to the base. I really had no, I mean, back to my ship. I really had no idea what I could do about this. But it turned out that this was like one of my first eye openings about what the US empire is all about and what they do around the world. And then I'll tell, I, you know, the, the process of my changing from a, you know, quote, all American kid to be an anti-war resistor was long and difficult. But the, there was another incident, which I'll relate now, which really woke me up, which was later, after I had graduated, I was training uh, as a jet fighter pilot. I was in Beeville, Texas, where we were in the last stage of training before um, being assigned to um, squadrons to be sent to Vietnam. So I was probably within months of going to Vietnam. And we're in a classroom and everybody's buzz, buzz big excitement. And it turns out that the, we're gonna be spoken to by a, a Marine uh, Colonel uh, actually a, a major who had just come back from uh, Vietnam and he's going to tell us stories about the combat that they're in and he talked to you know about uh, going on a bombing run and bombing a bridge and um, uh, but that was not what got me about this story because then he said he after he pulled up uh, from the bridge and um, uh, dropped his bombs he still had a guided missile left his aircraft had a guided missile in each wing. He'd released one of them, but the other one was still there. And you, one of the first things you learn when you do aircraft carrier landings, which I did, was you do not land with munitions on board because, uh, especially stuff hanging on the wing, because when you land, they grab you with this uh, wire on the aircraft carrier that you jerk to a stop you go from 140 miles an hour or so to zero in like 30 feet. So anything dangling on the wing is going to come off. So this pilot, he says, now I knew I had to get rid of my missile. He, uh, you're supposed to go out to the ocean or the uh, and uh, release it there just so it, it goes off and doesn't harm anybody. But he said, uh, now I was going to go have some fun. And he told this class about how he took his, uh, aircraft uh, flew over the countryside of Vietnam until he could find some likely target. And what he found was an old man on a bicycle. And if you've been to Vietnam, which I have just uh, recently, you know that a lot of times the peasants have these bicycles just loaded with baskets of, you know, food and produce that they, you know, gotten in there out of their farms. And this bicycle was all loaded. And this guy says, I, uh, decided this was a perfect target. And he released his gu guided missile and it was heat seeking on this old man on a bicycle and blew him to smithereens. And as he tells the story to the class, he's l laughing and smiling and the whole class of prospective pilots all laughed with him, except for me. I was in the back of the class and I was like, is this what this war is all about? Anyway, as I put pieces together with my experiences in Longapo and other cities where I saw the U.S. Empire and the degradation that they put the local populations in, and as I learned more about Vietnam, I realized that that image of this missile going into this old man on a bicycle with all his produce actually crystallized what was happening. That this was a war, as, a, as we learned you know, we studied, I studied more and I got together with other GIs and veterans who had been there, that they set up free fire zones to kill everybody they could. That there's, they had slow, uh, generals telling them and commanders telling them, kill everything that moves. And this was what the war was about, was just exterminating the population. And just to agree with the previous two speakers about what's going on in, uh, in, um, uh, Gaza right now in the Middle East, this is exactly the same mentality and the same thinking. There's even an Israeli commander who's been quoted as saying, and it's almost identical to what the U.S. commanders said, the Israeli commander said, destroy everything that moves. That's the orders they're being given, the, the, the Israeli army. In other words, and of course, the U.S. is behind this again. So it's the, the U.S. is the culprit in all of these monstrosities that have been happening around the world. And that was what I learned and what turned me against the war. And 
what keeps me fighting is that it's still happening constantly. The U.S. is doing this over and over in countries, Iraq, Afghanistan. You know, it just goes on and on, nightmares for the people around the world. And I'm sick of it. I, anything I can do to support fighting against this, I will. And I will always do it with the people that are on this panel. I Thanks. want to make, uh, if I have time, John, do I have time for a little? No, you're running over. Okay, I'll, I'll say. <laughs> you can come back in the discussion about, if you I, don't I mind. want to talk about the civilian supporters because. Okay, I'll, I'll come panel, back. And they were great. All right, I'll come back to that question. Yeah. Let me quickly ask, did, have you and Bob Musel cross paths at any point in the concerned officers movement? Did you? Uh, what was his name? Bob Musel. The name is familiar, but I don't okay. think I've all right. It. That's I would one of the my stories is I was doing alternative service and then actually doing it mostly anti-war work in Indianapolis. Um and Bob at that point was at Fort Benjamin Harrison, and which was the propaganda center for the army. They did publications. And he was active in the concerned officers movement. And I, we both have this memory of having been in the same room together and each of us being convinced that the other one must be a police agent. <laughs> <laughs> Bob has since become one of my closest friends. Uh, he headed the, he's headed many peace organizations and uh, is now very involved with environmental work. But in any case, um, the next, the next speaker is, we're gonna to turn to the other side of the equation and I will come back to the first speakers and ask them to give some specific instances of what their relationship was to civilian anti-war movement people. But we're gonna take, go into that side of the equation with Kathy Gilbert, who was executive director of the National Lawyers Guild Military Law Task Force and a specialist on GI rights, who was active in the anti-war movement and helped to provide legal aid for GI organizing. Kathy. Thank you. And thank you to all the people who've organized these webinars. They're just really tremendous. So once upon a time, somewhere around 1970, I was a student and active in my local anti-war group, the Radical Student Union when some GIs came up from Fort Ord in Monterey and asked our group if we would join them in a, a demonstration on Armed Forces Day that year, except they called it Armed Forces Day, which had a real appeal to it. Well, we gathered a group of civilians. We went down to the base and had a very nice civilian demonstration. The command at Fort Ord restricted all of the service members, all the GIs to the base that day, which I think backfired, um, gave sympathy to our demonstration, but we didn't get to do much in the way of, of supporting the GI demonstration as we had hoped. We were instead the demonstration. Well, I got hooked by the importance of the GI movement at that time, um, by the fact that soldiers were working on issues around the war, around racism, around the way that service members were treated. And they were doing that work under incredibly oppressive conditions, often with retaliation for even the most legal of dissent. And being hooked on that, um, and of course seeing the the real impact that this movement could have on the future of the war in Vietnam. I joined a group called Support Our Soldiers, which was sort of the little sister to Paul Lauder's United States Servicemen's Fund. And we did whatever practical support we could for the coffee houses, the organizing projects, the plethora of GI underground newspapers. We raised money, we publicized their work, we recruited civilians to go to these projects and be support staff for the service members. We must have done everything from celebrity cocktail parties to bake sales. And if there's anyone in this group who has experienced my cooking, you realize <laughs> what a desperate attempt that was. 
um, I did that work for a couple of years and then moved down to San Diego where I joined the Center for Servicemen's Rights and with it helped to form a regional organization of the GI Project in the area called the GI Project Alliance. We were there to provide support, to do organizing, to do education, but it was clear really early on that legal assistance had to be a part of that work. The sailors and Marines, because this was San Diego, the sailors and Marines who worked with us found that retaliation and punishment for, again, even the most legal of dissent activities was swift and harsh. And we needed lawyers, mainly from the National Lawyers Guild, to provide assistance to those soldiers. But we also needed help in using the regulations where possible to support their right to protest. And as the word got out that we did legal work, many individual sailors and Marines came to us just looking for help in getting out, in dealing with a family hardship, in working on a conscientious objection claim, or in using the regulations to challenge unsafe working conditions. And I just, I have to show this off. If anybody remembers turning the regs around, it's a pamphlet that we put together in San Diego to talk about how to turn the regs around, how to use the military's own regulations to require it to follow the rules, to require it to allow protest and to require it to treat people with some level of dignity and equality. I found that this civilian support required us to get some legal training. I didn't start out doing legal work, but lo and behold, it became a part of all of the work we did with service members. And that was true around the country at coffee houses and organizing projects, some of which started out with a legal component, but all of which ended up with a legal component. Meanwhile, the National Lawyers Guild was starting to get involved. They sent individual lawyers to coffee houses early on, but then formed the Military Law Project or Military Law Office in about 1971 and sent attorneys and legal workers to Japan, the Philippines, and bases around the country, around the United States, to provide legal support for those movements. I got to tell one story about the projects in Asia, in Japan in particular, to point out that being a dissident required a lot of, one, courage, two, intellect to figure out what on earth was possible under the regs, and three, cynicism. One year, with the backing of the National Lawyers Guild's Military Law Project, GIs in Japan decided that they were going to do some leafleting using the Declaration of Independence. Of course, they were all arrested in the way that the military arrests people and charged with violations of the Uniform Code of Military Justice. The guilt got them off, but it's worth thinking about what it means that a command would arrest and punish people for passing out the Declaration of Independence. The Military Law Office, Military Law Project, went on to become the Military Law Task Force in the mid-70s. I didn't join until a couple of years after that and got um, dragged into being on the steering committee and then being a chair and then eventually being the executive director. I'm proud to say that MLTF and the Guild continue its work after the Vietnam War being involved in anti-racist campaigns, in support for conscientious objectors, in opposition to Don't Ask, Don't Tell and its predecessor policies, and in supporting and representing resistors in every war since then. This is work that once you start doing, it's really hard to stop. 
Either that or I'm incredibly resistant to change. Maybe both are true, but it's compelling work, largely because the people we are working with are tremendously heroes to take on a military system that is not known for its sensitivity, not known for its ability to follow the constitution or its own regulations to allow for nonconformity, let alone dissent. It's an opportunity to challenge that imperial system that previous speakers have talked about at its strongest point, but also at its most vulnerable point. And to do that with heroes who are risking not just imprisonment, but in some cases their lives in order to do this important work. And I will tell one other story. Back in my support our soldiers days, am I running out of time? You're out of time. If you can that? hold the story. I'm out for of the... Time. Okay. the story will wait. Okay, well, we'll get back to it. Don't worry about that. But... <laughs> All right, so before I go to our last speaker, let me just say, if you have a question, for any of the speakers or all of them together, please put it in the Q&A. They'll see it and I'll see it, um, but that's but it does it is not seen by everybody else. It's just the speakers will see it. If you have a comment that you want other people to see, put it in the chat, but don't put questions in the chat. Put questions in the Q&A. Um, I had there was a very useful comment in in the Q&A and I just asked them to move it over to the chat. And uh, so that's the way the system functions, comments in the chat, questions in the Q&A. And uh, as I say, we will have some open discussion among the panelists and then we'll, we'll try to address as many of the questions as possible. So our last speaker is Paul Lauder, who is a member of the Vietnam Peace Commemoration Committee and is been involved in designing this whole program. Um, he, like both of us have in common that we worked for the American Friends Service Committee. I was in the national office doing their Indochina program. He was in the Chicago region office. He was the peace secretary for the whole region. And he went on to be executive director of the US Servicemen's Fund that provided support for GI coffee houses, underground newspapers and organizing projects. He was also a professor at Trinity uh, University and he became the president of the American Studies Association and was very involved with post-war Vietnam in that capacity. So Paul, you wrap up the presentations uh, and then we'll come back to discussion with the panelists. You have to unmute yourself though. I'm unmuted. Okay. I think I'm unmuted anyway. Yes, you're fine. Fine. All right. I'm not, I'm just not seeing myself. Um, eventually I will. Some of you uh, there um, will remember the uh, explosion of, the, uh, of a townhouse in Greenwich Village, March 6, 1970. Three young SDS activists. Uh, Ted Gold, Diane Alton, and Terry Robbins were killed. Um, it, 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 supposedly, the the story was they were building a bomb that was to be used at a dance at Fort Dix, Dix here in New Jersey. Uh, that grew out of a certain view that was very common in the anti-war movement, that the soldiers, soldiers were enemies, uh, potential or... Um, uh, actual carrying out an illegal, immoral, and hideous war against the Vietnamese people. Uh, I don't know whether, in fact, the dance was a, the target, but it was a widespread view uh, in uh, the peace movement that soldiers were potentially, uh, if not really, an enemy. Others had a very different view of GIs, that they were average working-class guys, for the most part, trapped by the draft, by patriotism, even by loyalty to their comrades, um, being subjected to indoctrination to become warriors. What if we could find ways to support GIs against the military system 
uh, help liberate them from the pressures to conform, obey, and ultimately kill. Um, the efforts in that direction were already underway by 1967. And uh, certainly by 1968, when the U.S. Servicemen's Fund was formed. Um, and I'm going to talk about the issues from the perspective of USSF. First, um, there is a lot more in information, if you're interested in it, about USSF in the Wikipedia entry that John Kent wrote. It's a wonderful entry. Second, um, we had three fo focuses or foci, whatever, that Kathy has mentioned on uh, supporting coffee houses, GI newspapers, and um, entertainment, uh, particularly in the form of the FDA show. The third, that um, USSF uh, and a lot of the work around it was started by uh, uh, particular activists, Howard Levy, Howard Levy, Freddie Gardner and Bob Zevin, and I want to mention them um, for a number of reasons. Uh, Howard Levy was um, uh, sent up to Leavenworth for refusing orders to teach Green Berets dermatology to use in Vietnam. Bob Zevin was an economist uh, at Columbia. He was one of the organizers of Resist, an organization that continues to exist to this day. Um, he designed the um, the uh, sort of economic base. I remember my son, who was, uh, uh, you know, um, less than 10, uh, sending, I think, a dollar a month uh, mm -hmm. to resist because that's the way in which uh, those things were, were done. Um, and Freddie Gardner. Uh, Freddie may be out there among the audience. I don't know. Uh, Fred with Donna Mickelson, uh, set up the first coffee house in Columbia, South Carolina, near Fort Jackson. Um, those of you who have ever been in one of these towns near a GI base will know what it was like. The, the towns are one bar, one schlock shop, um, one whorehouse after another, designed to, to depart GIs from their money. Gardner said, uh, that's a uh, quote I love, that GIs would, quote, rather be working, be making love to Jimi Hendrix music than war to the lies of Lyndon Johnson. Absolutely. And he and, and Donna set up a coffee house. It was very, con very, very countercultural. The posters on the wall, the music, the coffee, the reading material. Unlike most places in these kinds of towns, the coffee houses were where GIs could hang, could talk, could read, to smoke some grass, and to organize if they wished to do so. They provided organizing bases if the GIs wanted to, and they did. The idea spread rapidly, carried by word of mouth, by key organizers, um, by uh, by the time USSF was founded in 1968, there were already four coffee houses. The major focus for USSF uh, work was funding, training staff, supporting organizers who traveled, some vets, some civilians, also material support, you know, finding projects, uh, mimeograph machines and projectors. The GI reading in coffee houses was very varied. IF Stones Weekly, Marx, mainly GI underground newspapers. When I started working for um, USSF, I sat down and read dozens and dozens of, new, of uh, GI underground newspapers from all over the world. It was an education. I could not imagine what was going on everywhere throughout the world. Um, just the, a few to start with um, in the early, uh, earlier in the, in the 60s, um, but by, by the end, about 400 mimeographed, printed. Remember, there was no internet. 
So this is the way in which uh, communication went on. Uh, many civilians, some of you out there uh, now, helped with these newspapers, editing them, uh, helping get them, getting them printed, helping them get distributed. Because if you were a GI distributing one of these underground papers, you could be busted, which was regularly done, as uh, a couple of the speakers already said, and f financed because the, the papers cost more than what we could at USSF provide. When we got a copy of a newspaper, we sent out money. The most well-known um, uh, project, uh, so to speak, of USSF was entertainment, and the most well-known form of entertainment was the FTA show. Apparently, uh, Howard Levy was the one who suggested this, and um, recruited Jane Fonda to um, create this. And Jane took the, the ball and ran with it and did the most amazing, what she called political vaudeville. Um, USSF was theoretically the sponsor. Um, the first show that they put on was in Fayetteville, North Carolina, near what was then called Fort Bragg. Now Fort Liberty, the biggest in the world. They did about 20 shows domestically and about 21 overseas. Uh, one of the ones uh, domestically was at um, uh, Avery Fisher Hall, where the Philharmonic played. Uh, there are many stories about that um, episode where we, we helped to recruit Nina Simone in order to grow the audience and uh, to do various kinds of things that only Nina Simone could do. It was November 21st, um, 1971. Um, among the most moving of the elements of the FTA show were Rita Martinson's song, Soldier, We Love You. And the final, um, uh, usually uh, F FTA part of the show, was uh, Don Donald Sutherland reading Trumbo's uh, reading from Dalton Trumbo's "Johnny Got His Gun." John Kent has produced an entry um, uh, about USSF, um, which has um, and, and about the FTA show which has a number of the pieces of that FTA show uh, in it. It's really terrific. What became at first a small padre of people expanded rapidly, rapidly, so that before very long, the prominence of GIs and veteran activity as for example, in Dewey Canyon 3 in April of 1971, April 23rd, was the date in which GI veteran after veteran threw their um, medals, their discharge papers. In one case, somebody threw his cane um, out, uh, in, into uh, the US Capitol. They didn't attack the Capitol. Um, they spoke to it in peaceful, nonviolent, and tremendously effective ways. That was my um, limited experience. I, I've always been sort of an outsider. Um, I was a non-vet non working in a veterans movement. I was a man working to start the feminist press. When I joined Students for a Democratic Society, SDS, I'd already been a professor for a number of years. But the, the experience uh, of working in the GI movement and seeing it grow in the way in which people have described was just beyond belief. And to see the way in which the anti-war movement changed from its indifference, if not hostility, to uh, active duty soldiers and, and to veterans was a most amazing transformation to watch and to be a part of. I will stop there. Thanks, Paul. That's really, gives a good 
lead into then turning around the question. Um, and uh, I think it was John, you had some additional things to say and Susan, others that I, uh, and also Kathy. So if you wanna bring them in now, or particularly I'd like to get everybody to talk about the interaction between where you were in the military and this group on the outside of anti-war folks. Um, so whoever wants to speak to that, John, do you want to start off? Uh, sure. Um, yeah, the, the, because uh, organizing inside the military is like organizing in a dictatorship, you cannot do it without outside help. It really is essential. You, in other words, you're living uh, under. They can throw you in in the brig for you know spitting. So if you start uh, correcting your commanding officer or uh, passing out leaflets or doing outrageous anti-war stuff, they're going to come down with a hammer. And uh, if you don't have uh, civilian support for that, um, then you're just in serious trouble. And the organizations that came forward to, to help us were just remarkable. I mean, the, the, uh, the Pacific Counseling Service, you know, they counseled GIs on everything, how to get out of trouble, how to apply for conscientious objection, how to find lawyers. Then there was the United States Servicemen Fund, which Paul was just talking about. They were wonderful. They supported all the, the GI newspapers. And I have written an article about the GI Underground Press, which is on Wikipedia, which found over 400. Uh, the tabula, I mean, it may be even higher. I think it's it's up to 415 now or something. There's a, uh, they're all tabulated in there. Every single one I've been able to find anywhere that was published by, uh, within the U.S. military around the world. And a lot of those newspapers were supported by USSF financially, morally. You know, uh, you, any kind of support for a GI that's publishing a newspaper on a mimeograph in the back office of a of the military compound is helpful. And uh, there were a lot of those going on. And um, then there was uh, the National Lawyers Guild, the GI Press Service, the Liberation News Service. Uh, a lot of the new, uh, articles that were in the GI Press came out of the uh, Liberation News Service and the GI Press Service. These were essential civilian organizations that helped because they recognized the nature of the war. They realized that GIs and veterans were a key part of building a movement against it. They supported uh, these organizations. And it also flies in the face of this myth that the anti-war movement spat on GIs and veterans, which is just garbage. It, it, if it happened, it may be. There's been people that have researched this for decades, and maybe uh, it happened in one isolated case, it, and that's not even proof. So it, it it just was not a phenomenon. And I, I knew hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of GIs and vets. I never knew one that said they were spit on. And um, anyway, I've also written an article about that myth on uh, Wikipedia, if anybody wants to check it out. But uh, I... I really salute these civilian support groups. We couldn't have done it without you. We, uh, you know, and we were all part of a massive worldwide movement to stop the Vietnam War, which eventually was very successful. And we need, again, to do it again, uh, you know, and stop the massacres going on in uh, Ukraine and in uh, uh, Gaza and the Middle East. This is just abomination after abomination. Paul said that, and I think it's true, I'm remembering back, and I think while the spitting stories are Rambo and false history, it was clear that there was a lot of antipathy of people on college campuses. And, you know, there was some elitism or attitudes about who were the GIs. But there was a negativity in a portion of the anti-war movement. And, and that only, I think, turned around on a broad level when you had organized groups of veterans leading the marches. That's right. But, Paul, do you have any thoughts about 
how that evolution happened and how towards the latter part of certainly after the the famous VBAW medal throwing events there was no doubt in anyone's mind about the role of veterans but uh well it was a process um and uh it like all all social change um it it, it was gradual um and uh you can't point to any one thing but uh, the the more um gi active duty gis um were out in in marches often leading marches um anti-war marches the, the the more that happened the more people wanted it to happen and the more people believed uh, uh in it. it it was that 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 growing process um uh, that that went on over over a period of time uh, starting primarily in 1967 but you know by 1971 it was really pretty widespread um and, and um people welcomed rather than held at a distance uh the soldiers i'd like to add to that john yeah, please i mean actually what i was going to mention and it's wonderful to see paul here i understand that fred gardner is part of our audience today he Freddy is gardner. indeed and fred if you want to speak you should send me a text and i can give you an option to say something but go ahead susan as I was saying, so Fred Gardner organized me into the United States Servicemen Fund, and I became one of the veterans to help raise money for the Servicemen's Fund and did mm -hmm. go to a number of the different bases, actually was at what was then called Fort Bragg, was in San Diego, Kathy, so our paths must have crossed at that time, spoke there with the Green Machine and Movement for a Democrat Right, and and was present at one of the demonstrations with Angela Davis and Howard Levy, where we were almost mobbed at that time by the angry people of the town. But United States Servicemen's Fund was very important in funding and making sure that we were able as ex-GIs to go to different places and to then speak with guys who were in the service. And I know I say the same thing that most of you do, it's guys. Primarily, it was men who were in the military and who we were trying to organize. I will say it was a little difficult at that time, being a woman and sitting down to talk to a young service man because they couldn't believe a woman had been in the military. But it was part of our organizing of bringing those of us who had been on active duty into the coffee houses. And it was very effective. That was in the earlier years. Um, again, Fred Gardner, Howard, and I went traveling to a number of the coffee houses. I thought I would also like to bring up to date the ongoing impact of the 60s and the 70s. And mention, I know you all can see the Veterans for Peace flag behind me, but today there are several members that I think it's important to learn about because today as we, those of us who are active in the 60s and early 70s were active just to say we were involved with all of you and you influenced all of us. The Vice President of Veterans for Peace as I would like to mention a couple of names, is Mike Wong, who was in the military. He had gone through ROTC. He really believed in the mission of the country and was maybe going overseas. He did have, in his early days, he met an organizer from um, SDS who had an influence on him. And so as it got closer and closer, to the date for Mike to be shipped overseas, his opinion about the American war in Vietnam changed. And he then decided that he could not go overseas. As I mentioned today, he is vice president of Veterans for Peace. He is one of the GIs who went to Canada 
didn't come back until 1975. He managed to get his education there and came back as a social worker. Um, Paul, you mentioned all the GI newspapers and John, you also mentioned them. Paul Cox was an active duty Marine who went to Vietnam for two tours of duty. He saw things that horrified him. And when he came back, he began to work with a number of different veterans organizations, including, and I know we all say, oh my goodness, but the American Legion, in which he's had a major impact in trying to stop the privatization of the Veterans Administration hospitals. He also handed out a paper that they called Rage and handed it out in active duty military barracks. He got an honorable discharge from the military. The current treasurer of VFP, Mike Tork, spent a year in Vietnam. He held what he saw inside of him until one day he became aware of how much damage it had done to him. And he became a very active anti-war and peace veteran and joined forces with the School of America's Watch. Mike Ferner, who's the current National Director of Veterans for Peace, was also in the United States Navy and came out, he was able to get a discharge of a conscientious objector. I mention all of these people because each one individually needed and got the support of civilians in the anti-war and peace and justice community. It's extraordinary when we think that all of our paths crossed. Um, and now here we are, how many years later, saying we all need to work together to stop the massacre and genocide that's going on in Gaza. We need to stop the sell of the arms and armament across to Ukraine. We need to stop the madness. And I'll just say, I know I sound like I'm on um, a soapbox, but we all need to continue to do some work. And, and thank you all for your ongoing support. I'll mention quickly, Kathy is on the VFP advisory board. And thank okay. you, John, thank you for getting us all together today. And that's a good lead into Kathy to tell her story that I cut her off from. You have to unmute yourself. It's a short story, but it's about my later remarks that the GIs involved in this work really were heroes, really are heroes. When I was in my Support Our Soldiers work, we did leafleting at the San Francisco airport with an underground paper. And one of the soldiers who took a copy from one of us, wrote back to SOS, and we became pen pals of a sort. He began distributing the newspaper at his base in Vietnam, organized an anti-war demonstration on the base in Vietnam, and as anybody could guess, he immediately got orders to the front. Knowing that it was a possible death sentence, he stopped taking his malaria medication and traded, unless there's been some change that Susan would know about and I don't, um, traded that possible death sentence for a life of recurring malaria, but was sent home again with a medical discharge. That kind of high stakes, that kind of heroism is something that, that the civilian support side didn't face directly, although there were incidents, but it's my sense that the soldiers on their own gave us the impetus to go on and continue to do so. That their bravery in the face of that military machine fuels much of the anti-war movement. So that was my Thank point. Thank you. Yes, that's a great story. JJ, I'm gonna come see if you have something to add, but let me just make a commercial announcement because our numbers, after an hour, the numbers begin to go off and we've lost about 20 people. We'll continue this until 7.30, but uh, if you need to go on, go to the rest of your life, 
feel free and then you'll be able to watch it all on YouTube in the next day or so. And we'll be sending you a notice about where the link is. Um, in that notice, there will also be a gentle request for financial support. These Nobody gets paid for any of this except the Zoom Corporation, <laughs> which we have to uh, pay a, a monthly fee to, to uh, be able to maintain the webinar level of subscription. Um, so if anybody on it has deep or shallow pockets, we will be sending out the link and your donation is tax deductible and would be very gratefully received. The other thing I wanna say is that on the 29th of, and you may have seen this in the earlier notices, the 29th of November after Thanksgiving, we'll be having a panel to talk about three of the films that came out of, in one way or another, out of and are related to the GI resistance. Um, Jane Fonda and Holly Near will be talking about FTA, and we're honored to have both of them. Uh, very rare to, to be able to have both of them together to do that. Um, the uh, Sir No Sir, um, now where's my, oh, David. David Zeiger. Zeiger. Yeah, I can't read my own writing. David, David Zeiger will be talking about that. And Connie Field will be talking about her film, um, The Whistleblower Me Lie, which is about the helicopter pilot who intervened and saved some lives. And it's, um, you will see on our blog page, the link to how you can rent all of those films uh, for it's about five bucks for a single shot or that you can buy them in some cases. Um, but the, uh, so we're hoping in between this program and the 29th, if you haven't seen them, that people have a chance to watch them. Uh, I'm told, though I've not seen the latest version of FTA, that there is a very eloquent introduction by Jane to it. Um, so environment is not the only thing on her horizon. Um, and uh, we hope that that discussion will attract even more people. Um, so I think that's the end of my commercial announcements. So JJ, do you want to add something about this relationship? You did a little bit about the support and the folks you worked with, but if you have anything more you want to say about the relationship, and then I'll pick up a couple of the questions. Yeah, I mean, yeah, you know, very often um, we're praised for, for, because we, you know, we went public. We, we went public, public because we thought it would be able to um, influence other GIs and also um, help to build a movement. But I think it's important that to, to admit, to, to acknowledge that our going public in a way also was a way to protect ourselves because we had eyes on us and, and, and you know, we had some finances, we were able to, to, to prevent the um the military from abusing us because folks said you know you know what you guys are first there's no one else is in, in Leavenworth or, or, or on your side so you guys are going to be in trouble but because we had um support on the outside it was able to 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 give us some measure of protection on the inside and one more point when we first got to Leavenworth the guards were pretty pretty bad by the time we left, they pretty much were on our side. The, the, the attitude had changed so drastically and we were no longer you know, concerned that, you know, that we would be treated differently. We were just you know, two of the 1,500, three of the 1,500 soldiers there. But um, having the, the, the support of, of the peace movement, the anti-war movement gave us a measure of protection inside. Right. Um, one of the James Brannon just posted something in the Q and A, which, if you could put it also in the in the chat, it would be helpful. The chat will be published. It'll be on either on our blog page where the bios are, or it'll be a separate page on our blog. Um, so everything that goes into that chat um, will be 
permanently available to everybody who watches the, the video. But we had a, there are a couple of questions. Somebody, to bring things in a more contemporary, uh, and this is, John is in his comment in the Q&A, he talks about hoping the panelists will mention the role that the GI resistance movement of the Vietnam era inspired and fueled anti-war pro-service member activism in the more recent era, uh, particularly with the coffee houses that were active around 2008 to 2012. Okay, that's new information to me. Um, I didn't know there were coffee houses active in 2008 to 2012. And James, if you're interested, I will give you an opportunity to speak to that. Um, but there was a so just send me a, a text or a chat and I will I can bring you up to speak. Um, but uh, it was also um, oh same person asking whether people could address the question of how and why organizing of service members worked so well in the Vietnam War but has struggled to gain traction during the US wars of the past two decades. Um, anybody wants to speak to that? Absolutely, absolutely. Okay. There's no longer a draft. There's mm -hmm. a, there is an economic draft. There's no longer an every person is vulnerable draft. It All of the changes since then, we now have a professional military. It is offered as a way out of poverty to be able to provide education and jobs and training. And this is why a lot of us are still talking about, my goodness, there needs to be a draft where everybody is involved, not just people who cannot afford to go to college and to get an education and to have access to a good job. There is active discrimination going on today. It is why you don't see thousands and thousands of people in the street, because it's not their mother, their father, their sister, their brother, their child who's in, who's being impacted. And I think today, one of the things and one of the dangers that we need to be aware of is that if it doesn't impact the average person on the street, they are not involved. And that is, I'll just say, is the responsibility of those of us who have this conscience to get people together and to say, it does impact on us. It does. It deteriorates this culture. It makes us into nothing but an arms industry. We buy arms, we sell them. We're selling them to Israel. We're se selling them to Ukraine. We are sending bodies over there. And the reason that we don't have thousands of people in the streets, because they're not impacted. But it really does need to be everybody's responsibility to get involved with what's going on in this country today. Anyone else on that? I'll take a stab at that, Go if ahead. I may. I think about it a little differently than Susan does. Um, one of the nice things about David Courtright's book is that he looked at where in the military resistance was coming from during the Vietnam War and found that enlistees were more likely to be involved actively in anti-war and other GI organizing issues than draftees because they had gone in thinking that they had something to believe in to fight for and were made cynical mm -hmm. and angry when they discovered what the war was really about. So I don't think I don't think it's quite the all volunteer military that Susan does. Um, I'm inclined to think that there is a lot of poverty draft, and that of people in the military, there's a lot of feeling that there's nowhere else for them to go. It's a difficult time to resist, but we did see significant resistance during the Iraq and Afghanistan wars, not only in people coming out and into what was then Iraq vets against the war, what's now about face coming into vets for peace, but also we saw a lot of individual activity within the military itself. 
Some we never heard about until much later, um, troops that just sat down one day and didn't go out into the field or out beyond the green line. Some of it in individual ways because the military has, and perhaps social media as well, has made action more individualized, more isolated, and made it harder for people to connect with right. each other in order to organize and protest. So I see a lot of individual so resistance, sad. but a need for ways to bring that together <laughs> into more visible and collective action. Thanks. So, James, can you want to say something about the later coffee houses? <laughs> Yes, yes. The main thing I can share about them is that the, oh, sorry, my, my sound's weird. Okay, there we go. Um, the, there were, I'm sorry, my sound is really weird. No, okay, we hear you we fine. Uh, we hear yeah. you fine. Go okay. ahead. So there were, um, there were a total of four coffee houses that were more active in, in the more recent era. There was the two that were the strongest were at Fort Hood and at Fort Lewis. The one that I was involved with was at Fort Hood. Um, and these coffee houses, they really serve some important functions. They gave, they were a base of organizing. They were a base of people just getting connected. A lot of the resistors from that time period got a lot of their support from those coffee houses. The problem was continuity, keeping them going. It was very isolating for the volunteers that, that, that worked, and so especially civilians who were in those communities. And unfortunately, there was nothing like the, the network of support that existed during the Vietnam era. So mm -hmm. I think that's the reason why those coffee houses didn't survive. But they did some tremendous work. And I feel like that story has just barely been told, but there's a lot of, lot of really important things that happened during that time period. Mm -hmm. And that was in response to a particular war going on or it was in response to the conditions in in the military this was primarily during the iraq war uh, mm -hmm. the, the second go around of it um there was also of course the overlap of the afghanistan war was happening at the same time so for instance the first person to refuse to deploy to afghanistan was someone who worked out of, of un, under the hood victor augusto for instance uh, so there was that impetus, but over time, the, the emphasis did tend to shift and focus a lot more on issues of PTSD, the over-medication of troops. One, I know one of the last protests that was done at Fort Hood from the coffee house was a parade where the, some of the members actually marched carrying their Ziploc bags full of the, the, all the medicines they were being prescribed. Thank you. I think you've informed all of us of something we our generation was not so aware of. Um, Thanks for letting me share about it. Okay. The, uh, I wanted to end up more contemporarily because there are different opinions that have been expressed in the chat, and I think they should be highlighted a bit. And I'm not trying to resolve the difference of opinion, but I do want to note the difference of opinion. I mean, there's some folks who feel that that regardless of the, origins and the US and NATO role in creating a bad situation that still the fundamental question is of Russian invasion and bombing and aggression against another sovereign country. That's certainly the position of the United Nations. And the people who feel that think that there should be some expression of solidarity uh, support by people who are involved in our movement for Russians who are resisting, uh, whether they're civilians or military people who are are resisting the Russian military role. Um, to say, I think there are different opinions on it, and and this is not a, a a Zoom about that topic. Maybe we should have a Zoom about that that topic. But I did want to note that that there are are quite different views of, of how to understand what's going on in Ukraine and, and what the proper role is of, of people who are coming out of the Vietnam experience. Um, you do remember, just, John, like, some of us tried to actually, reach out go ahead, to Paul. Russian I, resistance. Yeah, I, wait, wait, let Paul speak I, and then you can come on. Sure. Some I, of us tried to reach out to, to Russian resistors. 
with not much um, success for various reasons, not the least of which is communication and the control of, of that within Russia. Sorry, Susan. And I would just, sorry, Paul. Um, our organization, Veterans for Peace, has been working with David Court Wright, actually, and reaching out to um, Russian resistors, deserted deserters from the active military, and we're also working with uh, pacifists and resistors in Ukraine. We feel that our organization is in very important in supporting no war and in supporting those who resist war and armed conflict. We have, again, if you want to go to the VFP website, you'll see our statement both on what is going on in Ukraine as a result of the Russian Russians coming into Ukraine. And you'll also see, I think, our very important statement on Gaza. They're both very consistent with our organization goals and ongoing beliefs, and that is to support resistors from all sides, those who resist war and want peace. Right. And I'm sure that we would all agree that we, the horrendous actions against Israel do not justify the horrendous Israeli actions against the Palestinians. Um, and that's that's a problem that is even more profound, I think, about the way that problems get solved and and that solving problems by killing each other regardless of your own sense of legitimacy and again the problem in in the israel palestine situation is both feel completely legitimate and justified in what they the horror that they create so any rate i think we will end it there um we will share the as soon as I can get it up, we will share the video and the uh, it'll take me a little longer to get the uh, chat up, but it will be on that page. And we hope that you can join us uh, again on the 29th of November. Um, we held, well, we're down uh, 50 people from where we were at our peak, but that's normal after an hour, the interest uh diminishes in these programs so uh thank you very very much for all of you uh the speakers and hopefully and certainly to the those watching it and and we hope that this video will get to a younger generation and uh of activists who will figure out what the ways are to support u.s military women and men who are objecting to the life they are now caught up in. So thank you. Any last minute comments? If not, I will close it down. We will do and what- thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank so you. And wonderful well, to see everybody. Yes. And this is, this is what my sister has taught me, which is this is a hug. So <laughs> a hug to everyone. <laughs> Un abrazo. Okay. Hi, Josh. Bye-bye. Yep. Bye. Bye. Bye.